let us take a look at our next question. This question is about class decorators and init subclass. And what's the difference? One thing that we know is that decorators are a syntax for performing common actions when defining functions or classes. I always find it kind of irritating when people say that a decorator is a function that takes a function and returns a function, or even a callable that takes a callable and returns a callable, which really doesn't get to why we write them in the first place. Remember, functions are one of the ways that we eliminate update anomalies. Anytime we see repeated code, we might want to put that into a function. If it's the case, we want to create one single source of truth where a change to the function that we wrote then cascades to every use case, to every using, to every call site for this function. So here this is a single source of truth for what it means to do it. And if we decide this also includes a function called k, that cascades to all three of these places. That's generally why we write functions. Well, if we wanted to add instrumentation to all of our code, one of the things we could think is, ooh, that's going to be kind of hard to do in a function that's nice to write because we'd have to pass a function or whatnot. And this is often a canonical case that people draw their, your attention to when you think about things like decorators. But generally, the more precise use case for the decorator is when we're writing a function and we're commonly doing something, everything we're writing a function, like we're commonly doing something before or after the body of a function, whether that is call some other behavior, like a check, or whether that is change the function itself by updating its documentation, or whether it's some sort of registration, well, that's when we use decorators. Anytime we find that we're doing a common action that should have a single source of truth behind how that action looks, and that action is closely associated with every time we write a function, that's when we should be using a decorator. And when we think about the decorator, we should think it really is just this syntax for turning something that looks like this into something that looks like this. The real pattern here is, are we doing something commonly every time we define a function or when we define a class for a class decorator? Then that's when we want to write a decorator. And it doesn't really matter what that decorator does. It could be registering. It could be updating that function. It could be replacing that function. It could be wrapping that function. It could be logging that a function existed for instrumentation purposes later. It could be running a unit test. It could be anything could be pre-generating code for a unit test. Well, it doesn't really matter if it's a function that takes a function or returns a function. It matters, is it something that we're doing commonly whenever we define a function? Now, almost everything that we do in Python is executable code. Everything exists in runtime. So just like we define a class in a function, sorry, in a for loop, we can define a function in a for loop. And we might even want to use this. Like we might want to put a function definition in if else and say, oh, if we're in Linux, define the function this way. Otherwise, define the function this way because we don't necessarily want this to be a runtime parameter. What this means is when we take a look at a function, we can actually see that it has some runtime existence. We can look at it. We can ask it questions of itself, like what's your name? We can even change what its name is and what its qualified name is. We can ask it what are your defaults? And we can define brand new functions at runtime. So your common decorator looks like this. It's some function that was defined at runtime that has a reference to the original function in a closure that uses functools.wraps to put a, a decorator within a decorator and it replaces this function with a new function that supplements some additional behavior. Consider, if you're not writing a lot of functions, you probably don't need a decorator. Similarly, if you're writing a bunch of classes and you commonly see something that you're doing every time you write that class, update the documentation, check that that class has something, add a new method, then you probably want a class decorator. If you're not writing a lot of classes, you probably don't want a class decorator. Just like if the code only exists in one place, you don't need a function, if you're not writing a lot of functions, you don't need a decorator. If you're not writing a lot of classes, you don't need a class decorator. Here is our conclusion for class decorators. Class decorators can be used to enforce constraints on derived types, but in a slightly different way than things like init subclass. In init subclass, we can say every time you derive from me, put this constraint or even add some method. Here we can create a G method on this class whenever we have a derivation. Well, with the class decorator, what we can do is the same thing. We get the class, and we can check it, or we can add extra methods. So a question may arise, where is a init subclass different than a class decorator when the purposes are kind of similar and the mechanisms are similar? Well, here is the guidance for how you can distinguish between all of these different mechanisms. Whenever you look at two mechanisms that are occurring in a very similar way, you should go through a sequence of questions to really see why do I do one versus the other. And the difference between init subclass and the decorator is, one, a question of where in the life cycle is this situated. For example, 
when we talk about new and init on a Python class, the difference between these is where in the lifecycle are these pieces of code, are these hook points called? Are they called before the construction of the instance or after the construction of the instance? And for things like checks, maybe it doesn't matter because you can't really intercept in between the new and the init in a line like this. But in the case of something like a type which is immutable, you can't change the immutable type after it's created. So you have to do any changes or any sort of, any sort of creation of dependent data on the new, because you can't do it in the init. So there's some requirements for where in the lifecycle you may have to sit. Well, if you think about a meta class, a meta class is the only one of these tools which exists in the lifecycle prior to the construction of the class. So if you had to do something before the class even existed, you must use a meta class. There is no other choice. When do you really need to do that? Well, it's hard because you can't really put it some intermediation between the creation of this class and any checks that you perform on this. So it's kind of hard to think of a case where that's absolutely necessary. But it is the case that init subclass comes in after the class is created, as does the class decorator. So all you can really do is, if this class is mutable, mutate it. But if it's not mutable, you can't mutate it. But you can do checks in either case and, and block somebody from continuing to operate. You should consider, do these methods, do these mechanisms override or merely supplement? Init subclass is like an init method. It can't return something. So it can only supplement this class, but it can't return something new. Whereas the class decorator can return something brand new, and the meta class can return something brand new unrelated to the original class if need be. You should consider how affirmative are these approaches and how disaggregatable are they. In other words, here, do you really need to affirm that you're running this code? Not really. You're kind of affirming that you belong to this class hierarchy, but you're not really explicitly saying, oh, I need to implement whatever this meta, meta class was doing. But you still are forced to specifically say, oh, inherit from this class. And you could say the same thing within its subclass. So it's very minorly less affirmative than the class decorator, where you're very clearly saying, hey, hey run this code. The other thing you can think is, if you remove the class decorator, is this likely to still be valid? Can you disaggregate the decoration from the underlying class? And here, largely, this should be mostly still valid. Whereas here, you could make a very clear argument that if you remove the subclassing in either one of these classes, there is no guarantee that this thing is anything close to valid. So you could say that the init subclass and the meta class approach are not as disaggregatable in general to the decorator approach, or at least they shouldn't. The other thing that you should consider is, do these approaches affect your type hierarchy? And who is responsible for defining the hierarchy? Generally, a type hierarchy, a categorization of entities in your program is something that needs to occur as close to the superficial level as possible because everybody has a different perspective. In other words, if I gave you these three entities, cow, chicken, and pig, and told you to classify them, you could say, for my dietary requirements, these are allowed and these are disallowed. But if all of them are allowed, for my wine pairing, these two are the ones which go with white wine, and this is the one that goes with red wine. Or if I'm a zookeeper, these are the two that I put in the mammals exhibit, and this is that I put in the, uh, in the bird exhibit. The way that we can take a number of entities and organize them is oftentimes deeply associated with our use case, and it's not something that we can generalize. It's not something we decide deep in a library. It's something that only the user code can really decide because only they know what they're going to do with this code. And this occurs in the real world too. You know, when you have things like bonds, loans, and stocks, you often see that people have really inane type hierarchies that they create, like debt and equity but their code is really just about pricing things. And what they really want to do is they want to categorize these based off of how they're priced by a single point or by some curve or some more complex comp computation or by how you perform some additional action, whether it's over the counter and you have some additional requirements for what you do to register the sale versus whether it's exchange traded. And the textbook categorization is actually totally meaningless. Well, init subclass and the meta class both enforce a type hierarchy. So there are things which you should only do if you can control that type hierarchy, if it's your responsibility to decide how these entities are arranged. And one of the advantages of the init subclasses, it's generally much easier if you have a complex type hierarchy to make sure that all of the init subclasses are run. It's just a super init subclass. Whereas meta classes, typically it's kind of difficult to ensure that all the layers in the meta class are run correctly, especially if you have a diamond hierarchy. For the class decorator, here you can think that one of the advantages of the class decorator is you don't have to assert what the hierarchy is. You just have to add in the extra actions, and your users can have any class hierarchy they want.